All right, friends. First, I'd like to thank the Banjo Collectors Gathering for being here. I had, a couple years ago, there was one of these internet discussions with a person that we all know and love, whose name I won't mention, not here right now, about how people weren't interested enough at various banjo events in banjo history and things like the ancient Hittites and uh, anyway. And we, and I pointed out to him, it's not like banjo historians have festivals and we invite the banjo collectors to come and talk about collecting or we uh, invite the banjo teachers to come and talk about uh, teaching banjo and we talk, invite the banjo uh, players to come and play. Basically, the banjo collectors gathering has become a home for those of us who've been, a section of those of us who've been uh, pursuing, seriously pursuing the history of the banjo, including some of the collectors, where we uh, come here and people know things we don't know, people know where we're wrong, people know answers to things, and we meet each other. And so much of the work that has taken place in the last 10 years about the history of the banjo, some of which is going to come forward in uh, Robert Wyman's uh, book, uh, Banjo Roots and Branches, some of which has already come out in some of the projects that we all know about, some of the things that are going to be discussed when we talk about research projects. And a lot of it is owed to the people, to the banjo collectors gathering, where some of the, these ideas first came uh, about. Uh, I know a very important moment came for me coming here. It was a couple of years ago, more than a couple of years ago, I, uh, when we had a, we had, we, we, we had the panel of curators from different museums. That's was back when we were at Williamsburg, and as usual, some of us, and we had this guy who was talking about the Pandora. Okay, and some of us, and that was when Ed Red in particular was among us. Uh, rather question what these people knew. And I remember, uh, especially the curators, what did they know? Even though Roddy, you know, was one of them. I remember going to lunch with Ed and I think somebody else, and we're talking about it, and you know, what is this guy, what do these guys know? And then the, we get to the point where, so, well, if you're a curator, of a museum making serious moves about spending somebody's hard struggle for money on a banjo. How do you make those decisions? Do you make those decisions based on some internet blog where nobody knows who is who? Do you make those decisions based on scuttlebutt late at night at a banjo camp? or at somebody's house, where do you go? You know, they asked Dutch soldiers, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. And the place where pe serious people in the world who have to make decisions about things in regard to history especially go, is they go to, not to the, your latest what uncritically developed web blog, or self-published book, but they go to critically reviewed, scholarly published research that, that is part of the process of producing knowledge. And from there, to me, and I think there were a couple other people, you don't have to confess if you were in the room at that point, began to realize that we were wasting a lot of our time doing other things. And that until the banjo world began to do that, okay, 
then we weren't really producing knowledge. And, you know, uh, to the credit of us all, a number of the people here have been doing that all along, like Robert Winans, C.C., and the great Robert Carlin. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to say that's a really big product of, in, in many ways, the encouragement and the thinking of, of this group of people. And for the history of the banjo, the physical instrument, the, the, things, the things that banjo collectors are the most anal about, the physical construction, the business history of these businesses, how the instrument changed, is of crucial importance even to those of us who are not that interested in that as the center of our work because they do show and tell us everything, many, many, many things about how people use these bad jokes and also about issues about tradition and change in different playing styles. A lot of the playing styles, you know, I, I, uh, you know are, are not that uh, even early 20th century traditional banjo players play couldn't be played on a Boucher banjo. Okay, we needed the changes that people like David Day brought to the banjo, and the people who noticed these things. Okay, about how the banjo they are. You know, I've had I had an old banjo of mine here and two, two people who were in this room got into an argument about what month in 1894 it was made. <laughs> but without that kind of knowledge, okay, that kind of knowledge is necessary. And, and even to those of us who are not interested in those things, but how banjos fit into life. Uh, about a year or two ago, I published this thing on this Oxford University Press uh, database site about the, uh, and they wanted it titled uh, African Americans and Musical Culture in the Banjo. And I told them Paris was like Henry of Navarre. Paris was well worth the mass, so it has that title. But when I read it, I realized that Many, many of the things that I put in, into that were not things that, say, in 2004, the first time I walked into the room in Williamsburg and met some of you people, or when I started to feel like uh, I had uh, I got dragooned into trying to uh, get interested in the history of the banjo and do research about it, that there are many, many things about that the kind of collective group of us who do the banjo history research, and not everybody is going to agree with all of this, have come to. And I think it's important to kind of enumerate them, uh, because I think those of us who do this kind of research are, have been just plain lousy about getting the information out and uh, uh, that some of the projects, especially what I call Bob's book, are going to be very important to do that. And it's, it becomes a regular feature of my life. Uh, my friend David Evans, who's a uh, blues historian, usually s sends people to me, like uh, music scholars from around the world, or somebody who's writing a book about this or that, and wants to know about banjos. Or even if I talk to David, who does have a gag in his closet, uh, there are things about the banjo, there are things that are very current that I and maybe 15 people in this, some of whom are on this room, understand, and they don't understand because we haven't been doing a good job of getting some of this stuff out to the world. So I'd like to go over in no order of, kind of in a historical order, but in a certain order, a number of points that I th that I believe are very important about the history of the banjo, that in 2004, or probably 2005, when I entered this more seriously, I probably, uh, I either probably didn't believe or certainly uh, didn't believe. And uh, 
it's also that some of these things are very important to the whole history. One of the most important things that the Banjo Roots discussions have done, and this seems not like a side question and may not, but it comes up to me all the time because researchers, especially people uh, that I meet who are researchers about African American culture, especially about the blues and other things, uh, and approaching me about banjo history, is that in, in his, in the, uh, starting with the uh, information that Olaf and Daniel Yada and others brought to us, is the stereotypical view of African or West African music especially loop playing, and especially the ancestry of the banjo being based on a set of stereotypes about griots or jales and their instruments, that these ideas, the ideas that this was the ancestry of the banjo, or the, the central, the only form, or the principal form of West African musicianship, this was disputed and uh, a more balanced picture of, of rios, jales, and so on and was produced. And much more significantly, the vast knowledge that Shlomo and others pioneered that we have developed about the, the many, many non-griot musical instruments, and especially plus spike lutes that existed that exist and existed and are part of the heritage, not only of the banjo, but of West African music and are part of the heritage of African American music and other African music in the New World. I think, especially as more of this gets documented, this is very, very, very important because thinking like the thinking that we displaced in the banjo discussing dominates people who want us to write much, very much research, writing, and thinking about African-American music. I had a friend of mine named Adam Gasal, who's a blues uh, scholar, who uh, wrote me, uh, was writing a book of certain aspects of the blues, and it starts out talking about the griots and the African banjo and things like that. And I had to explain to him that at least from the banjo, side of things, these kind of, we don't think this way anymore because we develop uh, other information and it's still a task. One of the most important things I think for me and then changing my thinking and just looking back as part of the bigger set of things on things I wrote is that, in, in a sense, the banjo is not African. That is to say that the banjo's origins are in the New World, among Africans in the New World. But the banjo is not simply something that was carried from Africa to the New World. It was something that was created among components that were African in the New World, but also components that were European. And it was something that's very specific. If you look at the early banjo history, and what we know about early banjo, it's not a general, uh, at least as far as we know, it's not a general picture of where Africans in general were in the New World. And indeed, if you look at uh, the, the, the deeper uh, work that's been done on the origin of slaves, that the areas in the New World where some of the most, the largest percentages, uh, the largest numbers of the enslaved were taken from Africa, and often areas where even more direct contact and continuity of Af African cultures existed in the New World in places like Brazil, Mexico, Cuba, and Peru, for example, there's no traces of banjos or banjo-like instruments. And 
only in a very specific number of places that are that are trace the banjo's origins in the Caribbean and uh, relate to areas in West Africa also that had banjo <coughs> that had uh, plucked by the blue uh, ancestries. I think that's a very important thing about the origin of the banjo. I used to think that if you really, it's just not people, white people or whatever people, not looking for banjos. And if you really looked, you would find banjos in Mexico or in Florida or in, in Peru or in Brazil or even among in one uh, conversation I had about the number of Africans who had been enslaved who were even in England and other places in Europe. I think it's important to look at the emergence of the banjo as a creative response to a new, not just simply the continuation of a tradition or people doing things they were doing in Africa, but a creative response to a new situation by Africans in the new world. As few as the sightings of early banjos that, that we have, there are many more sightings of, of early gourd banjos. In, even in the uh, 17th and 18th century, then there are sightings of, of African plug spike lutes in the New World, which, at least according to Slomo's research, there is only one and possibly two such sightings. And I think it's important to think about that in terms of thinking about the banjo, not simply as something African, but something that emerged, may have emerged out of African material in the New World. I think that, especially among those of us who think about the banjo in relationship to African Americans, but in the larger uh, issue of uh, banjo playing, I think we can all we can uh, we cannot underestimate the impact of the explosion of the, what I call the commercial banjo uh, industry in the 1830s and 1840s to the history of the banjo. And I, people used to, people sometimes call this the rise of minstrelsy, but I don't think this is accurate, particularly because the banjo playing started before 1843 when the companies, companies uh, used a performance model of minstrelsy. But I think it's very, very, we, we tend to underestimate in, uh, how important this was to the banjo. I think it's quite possible that if this had not occurred, that the banjo would have been like a number of other uh, uh, West African instruments or African instruments that might have been played in the early period in the uh, in this country uh, and other places in the, in the Americas that uh, simply disappeared. I think that uh, the, the, the explosion of, of the, because it was not just the stage performers, but it was an industry like Boucher. It was a permeation of popularity. I've been doing a lot of reading of the Clipper from the 1840s and 50s and the other uh, New York entertainment uh, news covers in the papers. And the, the, the permeation in, of that uh, in society was, was quite deep. And it also had a very important impact among the enslaved because it made, uh, it, uh, it certainly popularized the hoop head banjo. I think, as Cece has pointed out, the hoop head or frank head banjo was probably invented by African Americans and had been played before it was popularized by the minstrels. I mean, 
than, than the banking industry, but it's certainly easier. I mean, I had a lot of uh, some talks with Pete about Pete, but it's a lot easier to make a frame-headed banjo than it is to make a gourd banjo, and it's possible to manufacture gourd uh, frame-headed banjos in a way that it is not possible to manufacture gourd banjos. And <coughs> frame-headed banjos are louder, they're less fragile, and that ch material change in, in the instrument by, that was popularized by the minstrels and that did spread. I mean, uh, Dina F. Sang writes uh, somewhere that she believed that by the 1850s, the frame head banjo, even among the enslaved, had become the most popular form of the banjo. I think that change, that physical change in the instrument that was most popularized by uh, the minstrels was an important thing in the spread of the instrument, whether among the enslaved, whether by <coughs> folk performers, by, uh, or, or by African American. In, it's, in, in kind of charting this, following the African American banjo playing is my particular focus, there's no sign that uh, any of the developments of the banjo that, you know, identif either identifying with people like David Day and the Fairbanks <coughs> banjos and, you know, the, the stuff that line the walls here pretty much. Or even further, the uh, uh, tenor and resonator banjos were not welcomed and used by uh, traditional African American performers and European American uh, uh, performers. And that's those developments in the, the banjo, the development of the banjo by the banjo industry and uh, along the lines of history are an important part, contribution to the spread and the use of the instrument to people who wanted to make that, uh, make, make whatever kind of music. I think that also it's quite important to, to look at the banjo as not America's instrument. I mean, uh, it's important in, in America's instrument in the way that Jim uh, and, and others in the book uh, talked about that because I think there's this very important part of looking at the development of American society uh, for the bad and the good in the development of the banjo. But I think it's important to understand first the early banjo that began in the Caribbean and the extension of the banjo very early, at least to the Guy Guyana and Suriname, along with North America. But the very, very quick and early spread of the banjo outside the United States. If you read uh, some of the notices that the, minstre uh, the minstrels had, you had banjoists uh, from, uh, especially from New York, already touring uh, South America, touring the islands of the Caribbean, of course going to England and Germany, Admiral Perry taking a minstrel uh, troop to Japan. Very, very early, the banjo becomes an, an instrument that people in other parts of the world come to find that they can make their own music or their approximation of the music that banjo performers are making. Uh, Gerhard Kubik, uh, a uh, music instrument historian who's written probably the most famous book in this country among non-major music scholars is Africa and the Blues, sent me uh, the draft of a chapter of a book he was writing on banjos in Africa. And it was very interesting that there are a number of folk handmade banjos that he was surveying, but every one of them 
that he had found and, or that he described had the in innervations of the modern banjo or the, uh, you know, the innovations that obviously had come from banjo makers or people seeing banjos that had come uh, after the minstrel period from banjo entertainers from the Americas or uh, Europe. But I think it's important for us to more and more think about the banjo as a world instrument, to un even if we're just trying to understand the banjo uh, inside of uh, this country. Finally, I think, and John, can, John Hoff can now stand up, that it's important for us to understand the importance of the four-string banjos, especially the tenor banjo, but also the platform banjo and the mandolin. Various. We're going to have something on the melody banjo, and we're going to be told that the melody banjo is not the true ancestor of the tenor, but the mandola banjo. I trust, but that this is integral to understanding the history of the banjo. Do not un know. I didn't understand this issue that I decided to answer to get into this. Why don't blacks play the banjo until I understood about the tenor banjo, both historically and just from my own life? Because I, until I saw Sully Greg uh, Wilson playing a, a banjo at the Black Banjo gathering that I organized, I'd never seen a black person playing playing a banjo, a five-string banjo. I've seen plenty of black people playing tenor banjos. But understanding the, the tenor banjo, and it does have these mandolinish roots, and it is, you know, what it is. It's, it is not a two. Well, the, it's not a true two of all. It's my idea of a banjo. But, uh, if we don't, understanding it and how it's played, these other banjos are crucial to understanding the band, the instrument in the world is physical construction. And probably most people in the world who play banjos today do not play banjos that are based on the banjos in this room, the banjos that we own, the banjos that we like. If I go out to a bluegrass jam, there are people who are playing banjos that are descendants of the Gibson and Paramount resonator banjos that were principally designed as tenor banjos, not as five-string banjos. The reason, you know, all the RBs are so expensive is because they made so, Gibson made so few of them. They didn't start making banjos and uh, five strings until fairly late. But there's no way to, under, to really have a grasp of world banjo history without understanding the importance of this story and the ongoing process of the four string banjos especially, but all the other banjos besides our wonderful five strings banjos and their uh, ancestors. And finally, uh, just one, well, two things. First, banjo history is not primarily something that ended when David Day died, okay? Banjo history is going on in the world in a big way. I would not be surprised. I'm not the judge of fine banjos, although if anybody wants to finance my deeper knowledge of fine banjos, you're willing to help me, that some of you are. But I would quite, I could be very easily convinced that some of the finest banjos that have ever been made are being made right now, including by some of the people in this room and some of the people we all know and love today. And that the diversity of playing banjos in all kinds of ways 
especially that the senior citizens like me can never dream of is going on. And you can't, it's important to understand that because you will learn things about the old banjos, you will learn things about how the instrument is constructed, you will learn new things from that. Okay, so these are all things that I've come to, that, you know, if you'd ask me in 2004, 2005, I would have given you the normal kind of explanations about these things that some of us who are banjo historians are fighting against. But I have news for you, as much as I'm looking forward to more books and more information about that. I very firmly believe that what the general public believes or what people believe about that has nothing to do with the available level of good research and good information, but it has to do with other ideological processes in society that we are not here to discuss. Well, I'm finished. <laughs>